Good afternoon uh, and welcome. I'm Judge Sam Chung from the King County Superior Court and welcome to our webinar on anti-Asian violence and discrimination titled, Where Are You Really From? Uh, today's program is presented by the Courts and Community uh, Committee of this court in recognition of the Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month of May. Our committee presents um, many programs throughout the year in order to engage with and to give back to the various communities we serve. And we invite you to join our other programs as shown on our community engagement page from the court's main website. Uh, before uh, I announce the uh, and introduce our guests, I have a couple of announcements to make. Um, uh, today's panel discussion will be about an hour. Uh, we also want to uh, reserve about 10 minutes at the end uh, so we can address any questions from the audience through the chat room. Uh, we're also making available a report on anti-Asian violence and hate crimes that was published earlier last year for the Asian American Bar Association of New York by the Paul Weiss Law Firm. And we have a link uh, on that and on our uh, court's website. Our program today is being carried live on TVW, and we're also recording it to make it available later through the court's YouTube website. Uh, we have exceeded our capacity for a webinar. And if you know people who cannot get on on our web webinar, uh, please let them know about the um, TVW live stream uh, and um, uh, so they can uh, watch the program that way. Um, I also want to have um, a couple of thank yous to announce. Um, first to our court uh, leadership, uh, presiding Judge Jim Rogers, assistant presiding Pat Oishi, and the two co-chairs of this committee, Judges uh, Sandra uh, uh, Widlin and Michael Scott, for all their concerns on the issues to be addressed today. Uh, many thanks uh, goes to all of our staff, especially uh, Jim Peterson, uh, Beth Taylor, and Amy Rowe for all their work in putting this together. Uh, we are truly honored to present this program to you today through four very accomplished individuals. They are Ms. Mimi Jung, uh, who, as many of you know, is a news anchor for King 5 News. She joined King 5 in 2000 and is currently a co-anchor of the King 5 morning program. I, I won't ask her what time she got up this morning. She will be moderating uh, and leading our panelists today. Uh, we are also honored to have Ms. Naomi Ishisaka from the Seattle Times. Uh, Ms. Ishisaka is the paper's assistant managing editor for diversity, inclusion, and staff development. Her inspiring and thought-provoking column on race, culture, equity, and social justice appears weekly on Mondays. Professor Margaret Chan teaches at the Seattle University School of Law, where she is the Donald and uh, Linda Horowitz Professor for the Pursuit of Justice. Uh, she has written extensively on a variety of areas, including race. And I know that there are many, of, uh, many fans of Professor Chan in the audience today. Uh, last but not least, uh, we have Justice Yu from our State Supreme Court, where she has been serving as an Associate Justice since 2014. For Justice Yu, um, any attempt at an introduction would be a grave injustice. So I will just say that she has been a mentor to many people, including many current and aspiring judges, lawyers, and youths. I would also note that she recently was a guest on Jimmy Kimmel Live. Uh, seriously, uh, we are deeply fortunate and honored to have these four very truly accomplished women of color with us today. I can only imagine all the barriers and obstacles they must have encountered and all the glass ceilings they have shattered and continue to shatter throughout their careers uh, that could be a subject for an entire conference. We therefore honor them and celebrate these four guests on this AAPI Heritage Month and thank them for their willingness to, and their courage to share their thoughts on this critical issue. So please join me and give them a big a warm welcome to all of them. Thank you. I now turn it over to our moderator, uh, Mimi Jung. Judge Chun, thank you so much. And I just wanna echo what you said about these three women on this panel. I'm honored to be a part of this conversation, especially among such accomplished and inspiring women as you. So thank you for being here. And we want to have a really candid 
conversation today. So I hope that people who are watching and listening will walk away feeling empowered by what you hear, the personal stories that they will be sharing and the incredible insight that they will be offering you. Um, I wanna start though, by just uh, hearing from each one of our panelists. Uh, since it is AAPI Heritage Month, I wanna know from each of you, what does that mean for you? So uh, Professor Chan, let's start with you. Thank you, Mimi. And I also wanna start by thanking Judge Chung and all of the folks who put this program together and with the land acknowledgement, just very briefly, that I respectfully acknowledge that our event today is taking place on occupied Coast Salish land and pay respect to the elders, past and present, extend that respect to their descendants and to all indigenous people. Um, so I don't know if any of you can see the uh, writing on my screen, it's a virtual screen, um, but this month means a month of inspiration, reflection and inspiration. And I'm so inspired by everyone who's with us today on this panel, but I'd like to also sh give a shout out to our vice president, Kamala Harris, who is the first uh, person of Asian ancestry as well as black ancestry to be a vice president of the United States. And the quote here is, we've got to do the work to fulfill that promise of equal justice under law because none of us are free until all of us are free, which I think is a beautiful quote. So thank you. Naomi, what does uh, AAPI Heritage Month mean to you? Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I also just wanted to say thank you um, to Judge Chung and um, for the invitation. It's really wonderful to be here and such an honor to, to be on this panel with these incredible women and thank you for moderating. Um, you know, the question <clears throat> actually reminded me of a, of a quote by Stephen Yun in the New York Times, who said, uh, sometimes I wonder if the Asian American experience is what it's like when you're thinking about everyone else, but nobody is thinking about you. And I think that the, I think that the Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month is really the one time that people think about Asian Americans, unfortunately, in this country. And I, and I, I personally want us to get to a place where we don't need to have months that recognize specific communities because we're thinking about them all the time. Um, and I know we're a long way from that. And so at this point, you know, things like a Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month is really important. Um, but I want this kind of education, this kind of um, awareness building to be happening year round, whether it's October or February or whatever time of year it is. And, and I think that the more we have these conversations, the more we talk about it, the more possible that is. But I think I want to get to the point where people are thinking about Asian Americans all the time. Justice you. Yeah, I also want to just start with expressing my gratitude to uh, Judge Chung for putting this together uh, and to thank my prior court for hosting it. Um, I'm very impressed and delighted and honored to be here. And then finally, I want to thank uh, Maggie for reminding us about the land that we are on and uh, that it belongs to the First Peoples. And so thank you very much for that. Um, you know, as I think about um, API Heritage Month, uh, it, it, you know, I share the thoughts of others in a sense. It gives us an opportunity uh, to reflect on the wealth of our community and the different communities that make up sort of uh, what we call Asian Americans. But I have to say that this year in particular, it has special meaning to me because of COVID and the hatred that was directed at us and the blame uh, for COVID. And so this particular time uh, in terms of this year and this month is really special to me because it allows us uh, to talk about that, what it means to be the object um, of racism and the object of hatred. So we not only celebrate our communities, but I have found the whole month very therapeutic in terms of gathering with other people and seeing the beauty uh, of our community and being proud of it. And on that note, I want to start with the first question of this panel, which is, um, I want to hear your personal story. I want to hear your personal thoughts about how this last year, how, how seeing the hate and violence against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, um, how that has impacted you as an individual. Um, Justice, you wanna start with you. Sure. Um, well, you know, first of all, I'd have to say that for the first time ever, um, I was afraid. I was literally afraid to go out alone. I was afraid to go to the Home Depot. I was afraid to go out on the trail. And that's because I spend a lot of my time down here in Olympia and Lacey because of work. 
Um, and I hadn't experienced that, I don't think, in my whole life, that I would have to be afraid because of what I looked like. You know, the title of this particular uh, CLE is, right, uh, where are you really from? <laughs> Tell us where you're really from. I grew up in Chicago, on the south side of Chicago, and everybody always asked me that, where are you from? And I'd say, well, the south side. And they'd say, no, where are you really from? And I'd say, the south side. I live on the south side of Chicago. But I knew, right, what they were really asking um, because they still saw me as a newcomer, even though I was born on the south side of Chicago. Um, so, you know, this whole year, again, um, taught me something that I didn't know, and that is fear. And I didn't let it overwhelm me, but it was really good to recognize um, that no matter who you are, no matter what status that you have in life, it doesn't matter um, that you are still seen the same and people can objectify you so easily. It's made me more sensitive to others uh, in my view. Naomi, how has this last year impacted you? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, similar to what Judge Yu said, I think when the, when the pandemic first started, I was really, really concerned about um, sort of the, the hyper visibility at the time of Asian Americans and in particular, you know, wearing a mask. And so I was constantly conscious of, you know, is even though I wanted to wear a mask, I was afraid to wear a mask because I didn't want to be, you know, targeted because I was wearing one, which is a terrible way to make a, you know, a, a public health or safety, personal safety calculation. Um, but I was always conscious as, you know, someone that um, deals with asthma in particular, that anytime I coughed, it could potentially make me a target by someone who was thinking, oh, this person has COVID because they're Asian and, and therefore we're going to need to like, you know, take some kind of action. So similarly, you know, I was very fearful. And I remember the first time I went to a, a supermarket where other people were wearing masks and I was so relieved. I was like, oh, thank God, I won't, I'll be able to, you know, keep myself safe while at the same time, you know, keep myself doubly safe, safe from anti-Asian violence, but also safe from COVID. Um, but I shouldn't have had to make that calculation. I shouldn't have been able, I shouldn't have having to fear, you know, coughing in public um, and having, you know, someone attack me for that, you know? So I think, I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of experiences this past year that have really pulled back the curtain on things that have existed for a really long time, but we're just seeing them in a much sharper relief now, I think. And Professor Chan, what sort of emotions have you gone through um, witnessing these crimes and hearing about them? Thank you for that question. You know, I'll, I'll be honest, I don't go around walking, I don't walk around with fear. I don't go around feeling fear, but I do feel a lot of concern for different people. And um, that includes my students, uh, my 89 year old mother who lives here in Seattle with a lot of other elderly Asian folks. And fortunately, although I've been sort of monitoring their safety so far, they have not been subjected as far as I know to any sort of outright acts of violence, but I worry about it every day. I also want to say that I have a very, very close family member whose identity that I, I won't reveal for purposes of privacy, who was attacked last summer and was badly beaten in front of a lot of witnesses at a Target store. And uh, I think that it was probably a hate-based crime, but uh, it's not gonna be pursued as such. And so I, I think the upside though, the, the positive of all of this is that I'm talking more with my family. Uh, we grew up like uh, Justice Hugh in the Midwest. I call it the Midwest, it was Buffalo, New York. So it was part of the Rust Belt, the Great Lakes area where we were practically the only Asians um, growing up. And um, my siblings and I are now starting to have actually more meaningful discussions about race because it's just so in our face. I mean, I write about it and I've talked about it for a long time, but I think there's been a sort of repression that's happened in my family, which often happens in families that have been raised in predominantly white spaces. So that's been the positive is that we're being more open and honest with each other about some of the things that we're seeing. The Atlanta murders in March were really the tipping point for a lot of, a lot of people. There was, there was certainly growing attention on crimes against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, but that's really when people began speaking out. Um, what is one question that you have received um, most often from people who are wondering how you're feeling or what are your thoughts on, on the current state of affairs? Margaret? The question that I've most received 
Um, and what do people ask you about most? I think if I think about my students in particular, because those are the folks, uh, my students and colleagues at school that, who, with whom I have the most contact, it's what, what can we do? What can we do? And we feel we're feeling helpless. Uh, they're, they're in law school. They, they presumably want to become lawyers to, to, to do something um, helpful for society uh, through the legal system. And so that's the one question that I think I've heard most frequently. And we'll answer that question a little bit later uh, during this panel because it is a really important question that I'm sure people who are tuning in want to know and want to be able to walk away from and be able to take action. What can we do? Um, Naomi or Justice you? what about you? Uh, what sort of things, um, what feedback did you hear? What questions were you asked? Um, what comments were made to you uh, after the Atlanta murders? I mean, I'll say for my <clears throat> for my readers, um, a couple of themes that emerged were one, um, one, why are you making such a big deal about this? Because you know, there's no evidence that this re was related to to the race or gender of of the people that were killed. So, you know, why is this? Why do you have to make everything about race, basically? Which is a really common refrain I get from my readers. Um, and then the second one was, um, if, if, it, if it indeed was a hate crime, then why, um, or why don't you support just broad-based more criminalization of um, all, kinds of, all kinds of things basically, you know, cause I've written a lot about the, the pitfalls and I will probably talk about this later, but some of the pitfalls in taking a criminal legal system approach to social problems. And so the feedback I got from a lot of people were um, then in that case, then, you know, we should just lock them up and throw away the key and you should support that. Justice, you? Yeah, you know, there were two questions. One, uh, it's important for people to understand because people said to me, why aren't you speaking out? Why don't you say something? And as much as I was compelled to want to say something, right, there are some limitations put on every single judge about how we speak or what we say in a particular circumstance. And even though that would not come before us in our jurisdiction, it's still inappropriate for a judge to comment on something specific like that. And very few people understand that. People just assumed, oh my gosh, you know, you're our highest elected official. Why don't you say something, speak out or come to the rally? <laughs> And I was asked to do that often, and it, it was very difficult because of course I felt the same desire to do so. But again, there are just boundaries uh, for judges and we could speak as a court and we did speak out as a court on race. But again, the opportunities to speak has to be done at an institutional level and not just individual judges taking up every particular event. So that was the, the greatest question that I received or the greatest number. But the other is people also said, how do you survive? How do you stay positive? Uh, and for me, that's easy is in terms of it was an opportunity, right? To see the level of care and compassion and how many people really do care. That sustains me through difficult times is knowing how much people really do care, even if they don't act, but the expression of it really um, fortified my faith in humanity. Mm -hmm. Naomi, I want to get back to what you said, uh, the question, very common question from your readers, you know, why is this about race? Or um, perhaps some people are wondering, why, why is this such a big deal? Um, I, I had one person on respond to my tweet one day and said, people get attacked every day. Mm -hmm. Why are you making such a, why is this such a big deal? Why is this um, leading the news? Can you answer that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the sheer horror of um, this this incident that killed six um, Asian American women in one um, you know four or so hour period um, I think was shocking and horrifying and and hit a lot of people where where they live literally in the sense that you know they were doing their they were at their jobs they were doing their work um you know they were just trying to live their lives and this person came in and took their took their lives in such a horrifying manner i think um i think it was just such a 
I mean, yes, we, we just had another mass shooting this morning. You know, this, these are happening on an ongoing basis, but because, you know, six of the eight were Asian American women um, and they were targeted, particularly um, according to the, to the person he was arrested because he felt like there were a temptation, as he put it, a temptation that he wanted to eliminate. Um, I think that just, you know, hit a lot of us um, really hard. And, and there's also this, this whole dynamic that I'm sure um, Professor Chen will talk about later, where, you know, there's always been this sort of belief that um, some people belong and some people don't belong in this country. And, and the workers who were killed, the women that were killed, um, have long fallen into the category of people that don't belong. And I think that's part of sort of the subtext of all of this that we need to talk about. Professor Chan, I want to add any thoughts to that in terms of, you know, this feeling of not belonging, feeling of, of being a perpetual foreigner, and perhaps that is part of what is the underlying pain and hurt that comes out when um, it, it, we hear or see um, stories of, of people being yelled at or attacked or, you know, the target of racial slurs or hate speech and hateful language. Thank you. I, I think this is a very pervasive, very long-standing attitude and sort of emotional reaction towards Asians in the United States. And I want to quote from um, a professor at the University of Chicago. She's a, a well-known English professor who's written about citizenship. And she argues that the citizen is not a political subject, but rather someone with attachments and intentions and pain capacities, uh, a subject of feelings who longs for what everybody is said to long for, a world that allows access to belonging, a sense of unanxious general social membership that ought to be protected by the institutions that bind power to ordinary life. So that's a mouthful, but really um, what I and many other Asian Americans, I can't speak for all, but I would, I would venture to say most, what I share with them is, with us, is a perpetual anxiety about inclusion and belonging to the United States, about membership in this country. Asian Americans aren't viewed as simply Americans uh, with full membership in this nation. But, and so this is, I think, one of our specific racial anxieties as compared to black folks, for example, who were brought here involuntarily, no question but they're no longer questioned regarding their nationality or citizenship. And that's something that, that we cope with. And um, of course, we talked about this wonderful title that Judge Chung uh, came up with, Where Are You Really From? Because I would say I would put any money on the, the fact that every single Asian in the United States has been asked this question at least once, right? And so it really belies this idea that we become, all of us have come as immigrants to the United States, except for the indigenous groups. And yet uh, only some of us are seen as perpetually outside uh, the, the nation and as perpetually immigrants. Mm -hmm. Justice, you, you know, as we try to dive a little deeper in terms of the why, you know, where does that, where does this pain and hurt come from? And where does this feeling of um, being a foreigner come from? Help us understand uh, where that does come from. Yeah, my own view is it comes from a long history of being objectified. Um, you know, uh, this recent violence against uh, Asians is not new in this country, and it's certainly not new in the Northwest. We have deep, deep roots of racism and white supremacy on um, the Exclusion Act that excluded Chinese, um, you know, the Tacoma. Uh, purging of Chinese um, is all very real in our history. And I think there are people still, right, who can tell you the first eye accounts of what it meant to be walked off Bainbridge Island because the Japanese Americans. Uh, you know, so it's not new and it's really very important uh, for people to understand it's nothing that we have done, right? We become the scapegoat for so many other things and it's just easy. And it may be easy because some of us culturally are just not in your face about them confronting that hatred. And what has happened is a new awakening. We have learned so much from others about what it means to push back, to challenge, to not accept it. 
uh, but it's certainly not something new. And where it comes from, again, is others. It's not something that we should criticize ourselves for in terms of the feeling. It comes from oppression and hatred and being the object of that. And I don't know. Mimi, can I just add something to that? <clears throat> I think I, th I think another another subtext of that is that is this lack of awareness and understanding that I was talking about at the beginning, which is that you know ethnic studies in this country is sorely lacking and people aren't learning this history. I mean, Asian Americans don't know a lot of this history, to be honest. And I think that there's a lot of work that we have to do to get people to the place where they're actually knowing about what happened in Tacoma. They're actually knowing what happened in the term in the incarceration. And I think there was a stat last week and correct me if I have this wrong, but it was something like 80% of people had could not name a single Asian American person in the United States. And to me, that's so telling and that speaks, and it's hard for us sometimes in places like Seattle where we have a really large Asian American population to imagine that being true. I mean, Mimi, you're on you know, TV every single day, but that said, you know, there's large swaths of the country where you could you know, travel all day and never see an Asian person. So I think there's a lot of work that we're gonna have to do as a culture and society to get to a place where this, this information, this knowledge is something that we just, learn as we go through our you know schooling and it would be abomin it would be an abomination to not know about the incarceration be abomination to not know about the Chinese exclusion act and we have a long long way to go to get there absolutely um, when I could just add to that um, yeah, just briefly I had the privilege of hearing Ibram X Kendi speak at the Seattle Arts and Lecture um, recently and what he said about education I just want to underscore what Naomi just said he said it's much easier to learn anti-racism than to unlearn racism, right? And so it really does start at the elementary and middle and, and uh, upper levels of education where we, we present our, our kids and young adults with um, a more authentic version of our history because we're really in, um, we're in a state of permanent racism, which may sound a little bit pessimistic. Um, it's been called Afro-pessimism, but I would think it's realistic that we're still in very much in denial of our country's history of, of genocide uh, with respect to the indigenous population, as well as the forced uh, enslavement and, gen and genocide in a sense of, of uh, folks brought from Africa. So until we uh, come to a reckoning with some of those um, past aspects of our shared racial history, which still have many ramifications today um, we're not going to be able to be in a place where we can have a national conversation. And because I don't want to, um, I want this to be educational and I don't want to just gloss over um, some of the things such as the Exclusion Act um, and the uh, incident that Justice uh, you referred to in Tacoma. I want to use this moment to, if you can briefly uh, explain to the people who are listening and watching what we are talking about, because there are so many people who are completely unaware um, of, of the Chinese Exclusion Act and, and other um, historical references to racism and discrimination against Asian Americans. So who wants to take that on? Professor Chan. <laughs> well, I mean, there's so much to say. And like, as Naomi pointed out, there are whole courses of ethnic studies devoted to some of this history. But just let me point out that the Pacific Northwest states were not directly involved in the slave trade. And so oftentimes folks here feel, well, we're innocent, right? But Oregon was the only state to be admitted to the US in 1859 as a whites only state, which is a provision of the Oregon constitution not repealed until 1926. Um, it also did not ratify the 14th amendment until 1973. That's within my lifetime. And it was one of six states that refused to ratify the 15th Amendment. And it wasn't until 2000 that Oregon, the Oregon legislature voted to remove all racist references to its laws. California, of course, has its own very complex history of anti-Asian campaigns. And uh, I don't want to sort of give you a lecture, um, but, I, but we've already noted in this discussion that Washington state has had its own exclusionary history. Um, and some of you may know this, but it bears repetition that the King County Bar Association of this county was founded in 1886 in response to attorney involvement in mob effort to deport Chinese citizens. And that's on, on its website. Um, like many other states, Washington state had an, an alien land law, in this case as part of our state constitution, 
uh, the prohibited uh, those ineligible to, for citizenship under our naturalization laws, that is non-whites, people who are legally non-white, um, to hold property. And that included uh, East Asians and many other folks. Um, and then we've already mentioned the Japanese American incarceration. And so there's just, there's so many examples of things that are not generally uh, taught or perhaps they are taught but students aren't listening uh, well but I know from my own experience that these were not things I was made aware of when I was growing up which I hope now students are made more aware of you know and Mimi I'll just add because also somebody asked about the Tacoma method um, and you can literally type that into any search engine on the internet and it'll come up and tell you about it and have photographs documenting this event. And this occurred in 1885. And what it was, was literally the purging of Tacoma of Chinese. And so they literally went house to house to pull out those who were Chinese and purged and torched their homes. Um, and it was thereafter that then that occurred in Seattle, what uh, Professor Chan just mentioned, right? Marching Chinese down to the docks in Seattle in order to put them on a ship to get rid of them. Um, this is important history for people to know, but as uh, others have said, this is almost a whole course uh, on trying to understand and draw that line through um, our state's history. Mm -hmm. And Judge Chung um, wanted us to mention Vincent Chin, the Vincent Chin case, which um, for people who aren't aware of, of his murder and what happened afterwards, why is that so important to the history for Asian Americans? I think the Vincent Chin case was was another example of sort of this economic and um, social anxiety that manifests itself in a completely misplaced and um, that the idea that his attackers had was that he was Japanese American and was taking uh, jobs away from auto workers in, in the Detroit area. And, and of course, he was Chinese American. And of course, none of that was happening. But but as we've seen over and over in the course of our history, Asian Americans, particularly um, Chinese Americans, the turn of the century, were, as you know, Professor Chun said, scapegoated and used as sort of a, a wedge to be the um, kind of the the blame for why you couldn't get a job. It was because of the Chinese Americans were taking your jobs, and and then it became this sort of like us versus them mentality um, that then resulted in all this anti-Asian, anti-Chinese um, attacks and hate, like what happened to Vincent Chin. And Mimi, the one thing I would add for some of our audience um, as lawyers, I think what the sting is of Vincent Chen, right, is the failure to prosecute properly uh, and hold people accountable for a hate crime. It was never designated a hate crime. Uh, there was no opportunity for the community to come together and feel that there was justice that was done. So when people ask, well, why, do, why hate crimes or why, why use the criminal legal system um, to achieve this, and it really isn't, because I share Naomi's uh, values that that's not always the answer, and we're not looking for more people to be incarcerated. It's about accountability. It's also just acknowledgement and perhaps an apology um, that this is the motivation and that there's regret for an action. Um, but the fact that that didn't happen is why it stands out um, so clearly as that our lives don't matter and it didn't matter. Yeah. I think the murder of Vincent Chin, which took place in 1983, has to be seen against the backdrop of, there was an economic recession going on at the time. Uh, Motor City, Detroit was under siege because of the import of Japanese made automobiles. And I was living in Michigan at the time. I was actually in graduate school and law school in the early to mid eighties. And I could, you could not find a Japanese car dealer there. Uh, there, was, there was literally none. Um, and the feeling that I had when I moved here to Seattle uh, about 15 years later, 10, 10 or 15 years later, and, and seeing that Nintendo uh, was a co-sponsor of the Mariners and that Ichiro was one of the, the main stars, right? Which gave me a lot of Asian pride, but it was so jarring to me at first because um, in Michigan, you just tried to downplay the fact that you were Asian American for fear that some somebody might mistake you for, you know, the enemy, so to speak, whether it was the economic competition or perhaps some lingering feelings from World War II or some other wars fought in Asia. 
Uh, Naomi, I want to ask you about um, an article that you wrote um, in which you said, yet while I was grateful to see attention finally begin to focus on the wildly diverse, fastest growing segment of our population, I also felt uneasy. Help us understand what makes you feel uneasy about the spotlight on Asian Americans right now? Yeah, <clears throat> and to, I think <clears throat> part of the unease is that, you know, as, as, as folks across the, the spectrum begin to understand kind of the nuances and complexities of a lot of these attacks that have been happening, there's also been sort of this reflexive, um, reflexive effort to take what is a longstanding um, trope of anti-Black racism and use Asian Americans as a wedge against African Americans, as has been the case in over the course of our history many, many times over. And, and you're seeing that happen again in this in the wake of, of these attacks. And I, you know, I have actually have a reader who sends me every example of a Black person attacking an Asian person. He sends them to me every single day to kind of prove his point that um, that what we need to be doing is basically locking up and incarcerating more black people as a way to solve anti-Asian hate. And I think that's a kind of a blunt example, but I think it's a, it's, a, um, it's a telling one in the sense that there's a lot of people who are trying to use these cases as a way to um, further, um, further marginalize and oppress black people. And I think as Asian Americans, we need to be really conscious of how those dynamics are playing out. Um, be really vigilant about where we're seeing them and then push back really hard when when they emerge. And so I think that that's the unease that I feel um, is are we going to again be used as a wedge to perpetuate people, uh, perpetuate people's agendas who actually aren't looking to uplift Asian Americans or African Americans. They're trying to advance a more white supremacist agenda, which is, I think, something that we should all be, you know, very vigilant about. And I don't know about um, you guys, but just seeing and hearing people speak out in, among the Asian American community, um, using their voices and, and, and um, having other people amplify our voices is unusual. <laughs> I, I've never experienced that. And for, personally for me, I, I get what Naomi feels. It's, a, it's uneasy for me because it's, it seems odd. I don't really know what to do with that. Um, on the one hand, I feel really empowered. On the other hand, it feels very strange. Can any of you relate to that? Mm -hmm. You know, I have to say that um, it, it, <laughs> it is a little jarring, right? To, to see the Asian community, the Asian American community come out and then others come out to support us. And yet I have to admit that my greatest hope is that the, particularly the Asian American community is going to use this as a moment for us to speak out on behalf of others as well. That the lesson is not just to say, yes, I too now can speak, or actually I'm embarrassed that I'm the object of this. No, this is a moment for us to stand in solidarity with others. This is a moment to say, right, all hate is awful and bad and must be rejected. And we have to stand more than ever closely aligned with the African-American community. We must stand as one with the Black community, especially uh, in the Northwest. We have always had a good relationship, um, but I think now is the time to not just say we have relationships, right, but we share power, we share prestige, and we're gonna share our voice. And that is so important today more than ever. What a moment, right, to be in solidarity together. And how do we create that unity between uh, marginalized group and groups and be able to come together Yes, I think that's a really excellent question. I was about to jump on to the end of Justice Yu's comments about the need to, to be in solidarity, which I completely agree with, and then the reality of how difficult that can be. Um, it's very, very difficult for us to, within the Asian American community, to address um, anti-Black racism within our communities. I know that there are some people, uh, including some judges present today, who've, who've tried to facilitate those kinds of conversations. Um, and, you know, what I think is happening right now is sort of a, a type of uh, democratic discourse that can be deeply uh, uncomfortable. And, and our discomfort with it is good. It's a good thing, but we have to learn to live with the fact that being uncomfortable is okay. 
right? It's okay because we're having difficult conversations. These conversations are not supposed to be conversations that, uh, or feedback, for example, to people about uh, things that they may have said or attitudes or beliefs that they may have. Um, they're not supposed to be fun or uh, gratifying. They are supposed to be uh, questioning and, and raising awareness. And, and that's, that's what plurality and democracy really should be all about. Um, you know, it's about broadening the conversation so that we stand in solidarity, but we all have to understand each other's perspectives first. And in the, in the same way that I think Asian American communities have to get around this issue of anti-Black um, racism within our communities, there are other communities of color that have the same issues with respect to Asian Americans. And so we all have to do our own work on this. Uh, Justice Yu, I want to ask you about um, the court taking some big steps in addressing race and racism. What kind of changes are being made in the legal community on this? Well, um, as you may know, Mimi, the Supreme Court issued a letter to the legal community uh, on June 4th last year that was um, frankly monumental in terms of our court stepping up and speaking out and giving other judges permission to speak to reject racism out loud. And that's just because, right, as judges, we wonder what we should say out of fear of somehow tainting ourselves as not being neutral. And yet we needed to say, right, that silence in the face of racism has nothing to do with neutrality. We, we must speak out against hatred and racism. Um, and we did that as a court and we called upon the legal community to do some serious self-reflection that might lead to transformation to change the way we operate, to change the way we think, to have not only individual, but collective responsibility for where we are. So for us, it might be rejecting prior cases that were wrong and harmful. It might be as we are doing now, we are undertaking a statewide effort to examine ourselves, to ask ourselves, when do we exclude others? How inclusive are we? How welcoming are our courthouses, much less our courtrooms? If somebody from our community wanted to proceed and assist in the prosecution of a crime, would they feel comfortable? Would they feel okay about having an interpreter? Is an interpreter even available? You know, so there's so many things that we as a court can do to advance the sense of belonging and inclusivity in a real and meaningful way. And we launched it. So I think, right, there's a role for every judge and every court to step up. This CLE today, right, is this court making a statement to say, this is important to us to host this conversation. And that's the role that we can play. We shouldn't be on the sidelines. We shouldn't be silent. What and how we say it must of course be carefully constructed. But we are part of the community and we care very much. And Professor Chan, I wanna hear from you about what law schools are doing uh, within legal education, education to combat racism as well. Thanks. Um, you know, the racial reckoning that we're facing right now, um, based on what happened a year ago, um, yesterday, with George Floyd, um, his murder, has really propelled a number of different initiatives, both locally with individual law schools, as well as nationally. So I can say, uh, from a local perspective, that our school has adopted a racial justice learning outcome, which means that by the time a student graduates, that student will have been um, in a class where issues about racial justice uh, are discussed and, um, and analyzed, in addition to the black letter law of torts and contracts. And in fact, what's so interesting is that, you know, racial justice permeates every single area of law. It's not a separate thing, right? It's not even confined just to the criminal justice system, which is where so many people um, locate their, their uh, thoughts, but it's really, I, I teach it in civil procedure. You can teach it in another course that I do, intellectual property, copyrights and patents. It's just everywhere. Its fingerprints are everywhere, but we have learned to teach lawyers to be um, as if, you know, it doesn't exist. Um, so it's a proverbial elephant in the room. On the national level, the ABA has a new proposal out, which is um, available for comment it's in the public notice and comment period, and it's a proposed revision. So the ABA, the American Bar Association, is one of the two accrediting body, uh, bodies for law schools in the United States. 
And the proposed standard is that US law schools will provide training to law school uh, law students or cross-cultural competency, racism, and bias training um, at the start of law school or sometime before graduation. I think it's a start. It's not quite as ambitious as what Justice Yu mentioned with regard to um, with regard to the court system in Washington state. It's not asking law schools or requiring them to really dig down deep and take a hard look at some of our teaching practices, frankly, or some of the other curriculum that we uh, have unthinkingly um, had over years without revision with regard to race, but it is a start, so I'm, I'm optimistic. Naomi, I wanna ask about your profession. Um, you're the managing editor for diversity, inclusion and staff development. So what, what can coworkers and managers do or what's happening within your workplace to fight anti-racism? Yeah, I mean, we have <clears throat> we have a number of different um, efforts that we we have been working on for a really long time, um, and I think one of the things that <clears throat> I'm really proud of is that, <clears throat> unlike some newsrooms, like we didn't just start thinking and working on this um, after you know the summer um, and the, the the reckoning that's been happening. This has been ongoing. Um, we were one of the first newsrooms to start capitalizing B and Black um, in November of 2019, and now it's just now I think it's actually AP style, I'm not sure, but um, it's now totally commonplace in, in the media. So, I mean, we know that there's there's never there's never gonna be an, a point in which we're done with this work. This is gonna be ongoing. This is perpetual, this is forever. There's so much that we have to unlearn and unpack. And I, you know, I was listening to, to um, the other panelists talk about the legal system. And I think there's actually a lot of parallels between the, the kind of history of media as well. Like, media has long been a partner in advancing a lot of the um, the uh, marginalization of, of communities of color um, and have you know I think many newspapers have were actually you know champions of the intern infant incarceration of Japanese Americans for example and you know have often been on the wrong side of a lot of these issues and so I think we have our own sort of um, work to do to take stock and, and be accountable for what we have done and the impacts that's had on people, especially as it relates to the criminal legal system, which we know has you know, been um, terrible for communities of color for a very long time. And so I think we have a lot of work to do, but I'm, I'm really proud of the work that we're doing as a staff. And we have you know, dozens of people who are passionate about this. Um, we have a whole team of folks who meet regularly to work on it. So I think that we know that there's a huge um, task ahead, but we also know that we are committed to it and it's a huge priority for our newsroom. And that's something that is the reason why, you know, I'm really proud to work at the Seattle Times. I wanna talk about the Hate Crimes Act that we just signed into law. Um, I recently interviewed a uh, student at Seattle University. She's one of the youth activists that's been leading uh, some of the rallies locally and, um, it was right before President Biden signed that bill into law and I said, aren't you encouraged by that? And she looked at me and she said, well, that's wonderful, but what is that really gonna do? And I just thought, well, that, that was a, I wasn't expecting that answer. How do you all feel about having a hate crimes act? And what do you think it will do? You know, Mimi, I have to say that I heard um, Senator Hirono speaking, who you know was the champion of this act, um, and how much meaning it had to her, in the sense that this was the institution, the greatest institution in her mind, to right the federal government recognizing um, the fact that people objectify us and hate us and will commit crimes against us simply because of who we are in terms of what we might look like. Um, and that's not exclusive to Asian Americans, right? This is true for the LGBTQ community. This is true for um, other individuals. But the fact that it was acknowledged, especially the long deep history of anti-Asian uh, anti sentiment in this country, it was very significant to just even have it acknowledged. Again, there's dispute, right, about whether or not the criminal legal system is the answer and whether this is really going to reduce uh, crime in some way. Um, but what it was was an acknowledgement um, that there is somebody who is committing crimes against somebody because of a characteristic. 
Uh, and so I think that's why it's important. Naomi, Professor John, do you have any thoughts on that? I do, I, Naomi. I, <laughs> I agree with Justice Hugh that it is an important institutional signal. I worry about the focus on crime and criminality and how that might feed into longstanding issues within the criminal justice system. Um, but I do think it is an accomplishment within, within the bounds of you know, our, our structure of government. I mean, there are lots of other things that we can do to push forward awareness of anti-Asian bias and try to do prevention. Um, but it is, it is something that I think um, stands as, as, as a sort of a federal imprimatur on this idea that the government is not going to tolerate uh, certain kinds of attacks on, on uh, people of Asian ancestry. Yeah, and I, I agree with all of that. And I think that, you know, we know that um, hate crimes are underreported. We know that, especially in the Asian American community, they're incredibly underreported. And there's been a lot of efforts to try to increase the amount of visibility. And, and I think that those efforts are super important. And, and if, this, um, if this hate crime legislation actually um, helps in any of that, I think that's, that's great and something that was needed. But to, to kind of reinforce you know, what Professor John was saying, I think that um, there's a lot of concern that I have, and I know others share as well, that um, we have a hard time, we've always had a hard time in these, in these types of situations, like um, grappling with complexity. And I think that this is one of the areas that we have to really be willing to grapple with that complexity. And so, for example, you know, in the several of the cases that I've written about that took place in, in San Francisco and Bay Area, the perpetrators of the crimes were African-American who were um, longstanding um, community members who had struggled with mental health issues and substance use addiction disorder. And those cases don't fit neatly into our idea of what a hate crime is. And the remedy that those individuals needed um, was not found behind jail cell bars, right? The interventions that those individuals needed in order to prevent the, the incidents from happening was mental health treatment, was substance use disorder treatment, or all the things that um, don't make for great headlines, but are actually the things that our communities most need. And so I want us to shift into a conversation that's more about what public safety really looks like for everyone. And to me, public safety looks like people who have access to the housing and education, economic security that they need in order to thrive and survive. It means that people are able to get the help they need if they're struggling with addiction or mental illness. Um, and those things aren't in place, right? So it's, it's great to have this as a tool in the toolbox, but it's, it's not going to be the panacea that I think a lot of people are sort of making it out to be because those underlying conditions are still in existing. And until we address those underlying conditions, we're just going to have the same problem repeated over and over. And the goal should not be successfully locking people up under hate crime legislation. The goal should be not having the hate crime happen in the first place, you know, and not having the, the, the victims hurt in the first place. So that's, yeah, that's my thinking. One of you mentioned earlier that it's easier to learn anti-racism than to unlearn racism. So how, how can you, how can one be anti-racist? Professor John? That is a softball question, Mimi, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, Fix it. <laughs> you, you hit me the hard one, actually. So what I would say, just to tag on to, just before we move on from the, the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act, is it, that it does provide funds for public education. Um, and so public education campaigns about bias. And so I do think that that feeds into my comments here, which, which really is about education. I said this earlier and I, I don't wanna repeat myself too much, but I think we need to re be rethinking about, rethinking our curriculum um, from K through whatever level of education you wanna go through. But each of these different um, stages of human development and growth through education needs to include much more awareness and critical thinking skills and other kinds of skills because addressing these issues is not just an intellectual analytical type of exercise. This is very hard emotional work as well. And it involves, um, it involves acknowledgement, it involves 
awareness, it involves recognition, it involves forgiveness. Um, and what we have been doing as en masse is really forgetfulness, right? It's willed forgetting to, to use a historian's term about the Civil War. We've willfully forgotten a lot of our history. And so this excavation of our shared racial history and uh, in the process learning to be anti-racist is really about sort of willed remembering. And that's a type of skill that involves heavy emotional content, an affective content, as well as an analytical content. You know, Mimi, I would just add to that because um, I think uh, Maggie is so right on in terms of this requires such deep work and long-term work. But one of the things that helps people change their minds about others is an experience, right? An experience. Once you know somebody, people begin to shift a little bit uh, in terms of the little box that they may have put us in. But the other, and I'll shift this back to you, Mimi, is right, the media and movies. Um, so many people stop the stereotypes of LGBTQ people once they saw us on television, uh, once they saw us living a normal life like them, right? Going to work, coming home. Um, and the same is true, is that there needs to be an exposure of us on media, in film, uh, in books, in poetry, but in every single way, the more visible we are and the more we are allowed uh, to be visible, I think that begins to contribute to the breaking down of the stereotypes of who we are. That's such a great point. <clears throat> and I, you know, I said in another panel recently that we also have to be able to be our messy, flawed selves. I think sometimes when we first start to get representation, we're kind of like, well, we have to be perfect. We have to show ourselves as being completely flawless. And, and I think one of the things that we need to do as well is to show that we also can be wrong and problematic and messy and ugly and like all the things that humans are because that's real that's that's true and and there's no one one particular group that is and i think that's goes into the model minority myth it's like we have to break down that sort of the myth that's been created about our community we've got about eight minutes left before we take questions and i want to get to this uh this last major topic question um before we wrap up and that is, what can we do? What can our audience do to, um, to advocate for the AAPI community, to, um, if people are feeling helpless and not sure what to do, what would you advise, what would you say and suggest? Not everyone at once. <laughs> You know, I'll, I'll start it, but I know that my colleagues here um, have much to say on this as well, is call it out when you see it. Um, it's so important that people um, lend their voices to others uh, when they see something happen. That is just so important. Um, but I think we've talked about, you know, learn history, uh, learn stories, uh, open up your life to somebody else in terms of learning more about them. Uh, in, in some way. And, and I just have to say, I have so appreciated collegial support. My colleagues on the court have lent a lot of support personally, professionally, uh, that matters. And there's always room for allies at every level, right? The intersectionality of being female, of being Asian, for me being Mexican, being a lesbian, right? The intersectionality of all of that provides an opportunity to say at the end of the day, um, right, we can do this together, we can be better. Uh, as a group and as a community. Naomi? Yeah, that's such a good question, such an important question. I think, uh, um, I guess I would say resist the, the easy solutions. I think it's really um, tempting to try to reach for the low hanging fruit in, in something like this, but I think what's more useful and more valuable is to take a slower, more thoughtful approach. And like, just as you said, think about what we don't know and, you know, getting back to that willful remembering or willed remembering, I think thinking about if there are gaps in our understanding or gaps in our knowledge, do the work yourself to figure that out and figure out, um, figure out what you don't know, what you might not have learned. Um, there's, you know, 
tons and tons of reading lists you can start with. There's so much information out there if you're interested in, in learning more and there's um, no shortage of it out there. I think that um, another aspect of it too is, is just, you know, listening to people who've already been doing this work and already been um, working on these issues for a really long time and ask them what they think should be done. I think a lot of times when people's attention sort of focuses on something for the first time, they're kind of like, well, I'm going to invent my new nonprofit to end racism. I actually have someone who sends me an email about this new nonprofit to end racism. And it involves like wearing a shirt that says end racism. And, you know, I appreciate the sentiment. I appreciate the effort. Um, is that going to end racism? I don't think so. Um, and maybe that person's energy might be better spent partnering with a group that has been existing for a long time that they could, you know, lend their help to. So I think, you know, having the humility to recognize that this is not a new, um, a new, new subject, new topic, and um, lending support to things that already exist, I think, is, is, a, is a good way to start. So I think this audience is, this audience is probably self-selected to, to be open to some of these suggestions. And I'm sure that there are some law students um, and, and even lawyers in, in this audience and court personnel and others. Um, and so what I would say is just keep learning your craft, especially if you're a law student. It takes so much time to develop that skill set. And whatever uh, profession you're in, whether you're a journalist, whether you're a lawyer, uh, teacher, educator, um, these are really, really complex skills. So focus on those in addition to thinking about how you can bring anti-racism into whatever you do. And in, in addition to having those challenging conversations that I mentioned earlier. What would you say to, um, to people who uh, wanna ask questions, wanna approach you, colleagues of yours, um, who wanna ask you and, and, and have these conversations, they just don't really know how to begin what do you say, you know, can you open up and just talk about practically speaking, how to invite people into that space? Yeah, I would say that um, people, people have a different level of tolerance and openness to those types of, those types of questions. And I'm, I'm someone who has a really, really a high and open um, door policy for those kind of questions. Um, I, I totally think that my role in this, in the media and at the Seattle Times is to be kind of the bridge for someone who might be sort of tentatively getting their feet wet, but not really sure where to go. You, please ask, you know, ask what you, what you want to know. Um, that said, there's other folks that are tired, you know, and not really willing to, to be that person. And that's okay too. You know, I don't think there's a right or wrong way to do it. Um, but I think just asking, like, are you comfortable, you know, if I ask you a few questions about this, and the person can say yes or no, but I think starting with that question is, is really important. Okay, well, if no one else has any comments to that last question, I think we can turn it over to Judge Chung to take some questions from our audience at this time. Thank you. Um, I feel like all of our questions have been answered already. <laughs> uh, if you have uh, questions uh, to the panelists, uh, please submit them on, on the chat. Uh, there have been a few questions, uh, one in particular, what would you say to our young, uh, to our kids who are growing up in this environment uh, and facing these issues uh, uh, and seeing them on television? Uh, what would be an immediate message and a, 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 a deeper message for down the road? I don't know if anyone could address that. You know, I think it's really important to say to young people that they belong uh, and that they should be visible and that they should be whoever they are. You know, I talked to a lot of different community groups and when all of this COVID first started, I talked to a little Girl Scout troop and there were probably two or three Asian girls in the group of maybe 20 or 22. And the first hand that went up was this little Asian girl who said, where did COVID come from? It was the most important question in her mind. Where did it come from? And I said, well, you know, we don't really know. I said, it may have actually been something that came from an animal to a human in some way in terms of transmission. She said, I want to know, did it come from China? My heart just sunk, right? Because I thought, what, does, what did this little girl hear? And all I could say was, you know what? Yeah, it may have come from China, but it may have come from Europe too. 
right? They say that it may have come from Europe to New York. Um, and then she thought, oh, okay, yeah. It was that simple in some ways, but gosh, I just thought, how do we somehow raise up these little voices and these young people to believe in themselves, not to buy into that they are anything other than uh, right, good human beings capable of growth and giving us more. And I think how we say that is gonna be communicated differently, uh, whether somebody's in elementary school, high school, or whether it's a youngster that you're visiting at the juvenile detention center, right? Be visible um, and make sure that they know that they are accepted and loved in our community. Anyone else on that subject? I guess I think that young people, and by that I really think from newborn to, maybe not newborn, but very small to um, mid-20s, that's young for me, the, they pick up these, these ideas, they're kind of in the air, you know, the racism is in the air, it's, it's what we breathe. And so where did that question come from for that little girl and, and how is she going to make sense of it given her particular cognitive bandwidth, you know, at her developmental stage. So, I mean, I think, I'm thinking particularly of Asian American kids um, that to be, to try to be your authentic self, which does not necessarily mean being a model minority kid, uh, but could, you can be a messy kid. You don't have to be what a super American, super, you know, sort of assimilated, um, perfect child, all of that. And you have the right not only to be yourself, but to ask questions, of course, in a civil way, hopefully, um, but to ask questions of your elders and to try to um, hold them accountable. Um, my students do that with me. Um, I hear, I saw one question actually in the chat that is trying to hold us a little bit accountable too. And that's okay because that's feedback. And, and I would also say to the young folks, listen to, the answers and don't presume that you were born yesterday or that we were born yesterday, sorry, that your elders were born yesterday and don't have any experience because sometimes I get the feeling with especially some 20 somethings and I'm gonna be very frank that they feel like this, um, you know, this social liberation movement was sort of came about because of what just during their lifetimes, right? And it's a much, much longer uh, history of people passing the baton to each other, right? Uh, from one generation to the next. It's not gonna end in my lifetime, I know that. And it's certainly not, I think, going to end in their lifetimes as well, because this is a very, very long process. There's also a question regarding model minority. Um, and all of you have uh, accomplished so much. And I'm wondering whether uh, you felt pressurized uh, in a situation where you were expected to perform. Um, and uh, there are all these jokes about Asians being good at math and et cetera. Um, how do you feel about those in, in, in the aftermath of Atlanta shootings now? Naomi? Yeah, I mean, this was one of the most troubling um, threads of feedback I got from um, readers after, after that, which was that, you know, why, if, if other groups were more like Asian Americans, then um, we wouldn't have racial problems in this country. And, and you know, it's, I, I can't tell you how many um, emails I got to that effect. And, and it's a really hard thing to unpack because I think people see it in some ways as a compliment, right? You're, you're one of the good ones, you're one of the good Asians. Um, and what, what it does, you know, in addition to sort of um, <laughs> creating an impossible, um, impossible standard that very few people can actually meet. It also is a, a, a myth that actually hides what is true for a lot of Asian Americans, which is that you know the the gap between the the richest and the poorest Asian Americans is larger than any other group. And I think that for folks who are more on the margins of Asian American community, um, the model minority myth like really hides the the truth around the same. Um, socioeconomic challenges that face folks who are on the economic and social margins because you have this myth that there's no problem, right? So there's no need to provide support for Southeast Asian refugees, for example, because the model minority myth says that those folks don't exist, except for they do, you know? And so the, the problems that you've got this whole issue around Cambodian deportation, and, you know, if the model minority myth holds, then that's not a problem because there are no Cambodians who might be deported because they're all, you know, 
rich living crazy rich Asian lives, right? And so the model minority myth does a disservice, not just to um, the society as a whole, not just a disservice to other communities of color, which is, I think, you know, one of the worst manifestations of it, but it also does a, a disservice to Asian Americans as well. You know, maybe um, it's because I've never been that model minority as a biracial person and a sassy person on top of it. Same. Um, yeah. <laughs> That, uh, but I, I just want to acknowledge that, you know, just as a minority female, there's incredible, incredible pressure uh, to not screw up, if you will, right? I'm so afraid of making a mistake because I don't want to mess it up for others. Um, and that's a whole nother syndrome in terms of being the first in certain circumstances is I just don't want to mess it up for somebody else. Um, but I have to admit because of my own, um, sassiness and, and growth as a person, um, I haven't had to worry too much about that label. <laughs> Professor Chan. Well, I don't want to end on a super academic note, but I'm, I'm actually in the middle of a book that is, is very good about the model minority myth. And it's by Ellen Wu. It's called The Color of Success, Asian Americans and the Origins of the Model Minority. It takes an historical perspective. It's very well documented. And it's a really rich description of how this was constructed to begin with. And it really dates back to the early 20th century. And in fact, part of the Japanese American community's quest to become American, to be fully American, despite the fact that Japan was our en enemy. And so the Nisei 442nd, that was part of the model minority story. Um, after the, the World War II, the Cold War and the quest of Chinese Americans accepted by being anti-communist. So there was a ground set, a foundation set platform for this sort of construct of the good American being sort of hyper patriotic, um, hyper achieving, that kind of thing. And, and to go to what Naomi said earlier about it being a wedge, it was constructed in deli deliberate contrast to sort of bad minorities. So Asians can never be white, but we can be partially accepted if we buy into some of these sort of um, you know, white middle class sort of aspirational traits, right, of being hardworking, et cetera, et cetera. But we're not black either. And that was also part of the model minority, still is part of the whole model minority catch 22 is that we are people of color, but we are in some ways, um, the ticket for admission to be accepted is to pretend to be white, but we're not really white. And um, there's a good quote from Justice Goodwin Liu uh, in uh, the, Paul Weiss report, where he says, you know, he quotes, uh, they're honorary whites until they're not, right? Um, I should say we're honorary whites until we, we're not. And so there's sort of a conditionality always attached to being a model minority. I think our time is up. Um, a lot of judges have to go back on the calendar at 1.30. Uh, Mimi, do you want to add anything uh, for the group? I'm just reading some of the comments um, from people who are in the audience, just uh, thanking all of you for, for your time and your candidness. Um, so I just wanna say thank you. I learned a lot just being a part of this conversation and really just inspired and, and empowered. Um, I just wanna thank you all for taking the time to be a part of this. 30 seconds from each of the panelists too as well. I'll start again. I just want to express gratitude. Uh, thank you. Thank you to this court. Thank you, Judge Chung. And thank you, Mimi, for your thoughtful questions. Mm -hmm. And I'll add thanks to all the participants, the people who came today for listening uh, with open ears. Yeah, same. And um, there were so many great questions that I know we didn't get to all of them. But if you have anything specific you want to ask me, um, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm very open and my email is everywhere. So. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'll try to follow up on some of the questions that we didn't get to address today um, and uh, uh, um, after we uh, uh, finish today. I was gonna say um, drive home safely, but I guess it doesn't really apply because we're all remote. Um, I thank you again for a wonderful conversation and I hope we have these conversations again in the future. Um, and uh, Mimi, I just wanna thank you again for uh, doing this. And um, I, you know, I hope we didn't uh, ruin your sleep time <laughs> as a result. Thank you. Thanks to uh, you and uh, uh, Professor Chan and, and Naomi. Uh, we'll close now and we're adjourned. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Judge Chan.